Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the April meeting of the Surrey Arrhythmia Support Group. For those who haven't been before, my name is Jane Race. I'm the chair and public lead for Surrey ASG. I'd also like to introduce our patient lead, Rosemary Najim, and our clinical lead, Dr. Richard Bogle, um, who is a consultant cardiologist and clinical lead for cardiology at Epsom St. Helier. Um, we're very lucky this month to have um, our speaker, um, Dr. Odemeyer, who's not only a consultant cardiologist at Epsom, also a very talented author. And he's going to be uh, speaking to us um, uh, this afternoon on luck, judgment, and sudden cardiac death. <laughs> <laughs> and, so for the benefit of those who are unable to attend this afternoon, um, we will be recording this meeting and there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, I'd also like to add that all our speakers are giving their own personal opinions um, in their talk. So any issues that you have relating um, to your medical condition uh, needs to be discussed with your GP who knows your medical background. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much for asking me. It's, uh, it's an honour to be asked to do anything uh, because it presumes a level of competence which one does not want to take for granted. I've always implicitly been interested in sudden cardiac death. My first lot of research in Newcastle was looking at, uh, was looking at the prognosis of young people who survived myocardial infarction. And one of the things that struck me was that the traditional ways of predicting heart disease were what I, what I would call the bus, the bus stop ways. In other words, the sort of thing that anybody could infer. If you listen to people at the, in a, at the bus stop, you hear people who've just left hospital or relatives describing the condition of their, of their spouse or otherwise. And they would describe it in ordinary lay term, uh, layman's terms, which is always oh, heart damage. And that's the way we looked at it. If somebody died suddenly, we would go, oh, it's because his heart was so badly damaged, it was inevitable. And what struck me was that one or two of the patients who we expected to return to our patients for clinical appointments, who did not turn up, who happened to have died suddenly, did not have very badly damaged hearts. So imagine a scenario that we often come across. You've seen ECGs before, you know this is this is not right. So you don't need to go to a prophet to know that this ECG represents somebody in the last throes of organized life on this planet. And this is a patient who is then rushed into hospital because they've been resuscitated by the ambulance crew. And cardiologists, frustrated plumbers, photographers, and otherwise like to do something. So they rush the patient to the catheter lab, and the catheter lab, I don't know where, the catheter lab, maybe I should come to the other side, I'll, I'll try from here. The catheter lab shows that the patient has an artery which is blocked. This artery should come all the way down here, and it's blocked. And the cardiologist is delighted because, <laughs> of course, because the artery is not normal. If it was normal, everybody comes in at 2 o'clock in the morning, the artery is normal, you drive home again, and it has costs and implications for the environment. But this, <laughs> is what they were expecting to find. So they open the artery and they go home. The next morning, they do an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart. They find that the heart <coughs> is damaged in the ordinary sense of the word. We have several ways of defining it, ejection fraction and so on. Ejection fraction is the easiest. And it's low. And NICE says, somebody's collapsed like that, or the ejection fraction is low, puts in an ICD. So you ask the electrician, so cardiologists are divided into different groups. I'm a plumber, some are photographers, and some are electricians, and then some are prophets. The prophets, <laughs> the prophets are the professors, and so on. So you ask an electrician, and the electrician also is delighted, because uh, in, I digress. In, when I was growing up in Newcastle as a cardiologist, there were six cardiologists in the whole of the Northeast. Now, there are hospitals. I saw an advert for a job, not that I'm looking for another job, but I saw an advert for a job in Middlesbrough. They have 17 cardiologists in one hospital. So things have expanded. The cardiology has expanded a lot. But the corollary of that is that sometimes you have people itching to do something. Anyway, we present this patient to the electrician. The electrician is del delighted. 
that puts a cardiac defibrillator in. Something like this. Some of you may have seen them, some of you may have them. And that is the insurance against that ECG I showed you at the beginning happening again. So whatever we do wrong, that thing is there to save the patient in the event of ventricular fibrillation. It doesn't stop you having some other condition like a pulmonary embolus, but as far as fibrillation is concerned, that Wrigley one I showed you at the beginning, this thing should get you out of it. So that's our job done. We do all the other things we're supposed to do for that sort of patient. We give them aspirin, we give them beta blockers, they all do different things. This prevents clots, that controls the control of the heart, we'll talk about that later on. This may affect the way electricity goes around the heart, this stops fibrosis, that helps the smooth covering of the artery walls. And then they go to rehabilitation where they go for exercise training, for education, uh, smoking sensation and so on. So at that point, we're very happy. Everybody's <laughs> clapping and we think we've done our job. But there's a big but, and this is where I want to concentrate on this evening. The but is that it is easier to make the choice in those lucky few who survive to reach hospital who have overtly damaged hearts. In other words, I always say to myself, if you're predicting something, that the ward clerk can predict, then you haven't really added much by having been to medical school. You want something that is beyond simply the observation that even the relatives will make, even the observations that you hear at the bus stop. And what we've done here with NICE and all the experience we've had over the years is simply look at this ejection fraction, which is the echo representation of the heart, and almost worship it like a god. In other words, if you step away from the fact that this thing is generated by expensive equipment, it is no different from the Pharaoh in the Ten Commandments worshipping that huge thing. Do you remember? Um, those of you who have seen the Ten Commandments, you'll remember there's a big, huge, all these gods, and they were worshipping them and worshipping them. And the ejection fraction has become something like that. But we do know that we're simply taking a shortcut. Some of you may have seen this in a book. I saw it in my kitchen today and I couldn't resist. It's uh, an example of, uh, of answers given by candidates during exams. And the example is the teacher asks the student to find X. And the, teachers, and the student says, it's, it's here. In other words, we know where the answer is and we continue to hone in on the poor ventricular patients. But what we are missing is that at least 50 to 60 percent of patients who present like the patients I talked about have never had heart disease. For example, and you, you will have examples in your own lives as well, one particularly sad uh, incident was the gentleman who used to run my younger son's football team. He ran their team from, the age, from when they were the age of seven so they all went to university or went to learn their trades. And my wife rang me one morning about six years ago to say he died. And he appeared to be the fittest of the parents. The parents stood on the touchline cheering or berating their children. And he was running the thing. He, used to, he really even used to train them, participated with them, had his own football team. And he didn't went to bed and he didn't wake up. That was somebody who didn't have heart disease. I have other who are patients of mine who I have seen, who've had angiograms, had a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They came back every year. I got an email from the wife of one saying he went to play cricket. He retired. He even bought me, uh, he bought me a vase and a jug that I use every summer. I put ice cubes in it. Every time I use it, I really think of him. And he was playing cricket, running up to bowl, died. And his wife rang me. And I, of course, begin to reflect that what else could we have done to prevent that outcome? And that's what I'm about tonight, is to say, yes, we have made great strides in management of cardiac disease, but sudden cardiac death is still a big dilemma. How do we predict and how do we prevent it in patients who do not have overt heart disease or whose heart disease is mild? milder than that threshold at which we all bow. So 
45% of patients who, or 45% of sudden deaths happen in patients who did not have a diagnosis. Not to say they didn't have it, but they didn't have a form of diagnosis. And then another 40%, the ejection fraction, this number that we use, is above the threshold at which NICE would say put an implantable defibrillator in, either after an event or even before an event. And only a small proportion have had severe heart disease. And there, the predictability is very difficult. Here, we're still casting around. Even though I presented that first patient as really neat and pat, we appear to treat something of the order of, depending on who you read, something up to 10 patients who will never use the defibrillator again for one life save. In other words, we put even those groups of patients in whom we think, yes, we've got the answer right. There'll be nine or 10 of them carrying the thing around, they will never use it but they're still running the risk of all the regulatory authorities, infection, erosions, and all the things that might come. They're rare, but they're, they're in position. So even within that group, we can do more. I won't deal too much about on the genetically based arrhythmic disease because it's a very small proportion. It's a useful proportion, and I'll come to that later on. It's a use, useful group of patients, but it's a very small proportion as a proportion of sudden death in the Western world. They say that in America, for example, approximately 300,000 people die every year suddenly. There are others who die from failure in hearts because the heart has stopped working in that sense. But what we mean by sudden deaths are deaths in patients whose hearts are too good to die. In other words, they're not so bad. If we had stopped them or been able to predict them, those years, those hearts had a lot more life in them. And I extrapolate from that to say that probably 20% of the mortality in the Western world occurs suddenly. And this slide here just shows you, roughly speaking, the proportion of patients in particular groups who are at risk. So the highest risk group are the sort of people I was talking about before, which is if you have a patient with a bad heart, has had a heart attack before, yes, the incidence of sudden death in that group is about 30%. If you take the other extreme, the general population, it's about 2 to 3 percent. It doesn't look a lot, but in absolute number terms, in numerical terms, this is a far more important group. So although, so if you had the money and you had the wherewithal to control or predict sudden death, you would want to do something about those, of course, to the detriment of the patients at the highest risk, and of course to their relatives who are much more likely to shroud wave about the way in which money has been taken away from this my relative whose heart is poor. But in terms of society, you do far more good by doing something here. The difficulty here is the heterogeneity of the causes of their sudden death. It is not as straightforward as all that. Yes, all of us are going to die when our heart stops, but our hearts are going to stop in so many different ways. We're not all going to go in the same Way. So ultimately, we all, in a way, I was looking at it uh, today when I was thinking about something collapsing on your head. You know, say you're walking across the street and a big bulldozer can collide with you. Now, in ordinary terms, it's not a natural death because it's an accident. But in another term, it is a natural death because your heart has to stop for you to die. So that it just brought it forward in, a, in an accident. <laughs> in a, all deaths are natural in a sort of so this more or less shows you the same, same slide. If you don't have heart disease, the incidence is low, but there are lots more people who die without a history of heart disease. So the difficulty for us is predicting it. One easy definition that we use is abrupt loss of consciousness within an hour of onset of symptoms. That is when it's witnessed. If it's not witnessed, it's usually within 24 hours. In other words, if you see somebody the day before, we all, we all do it. I don't know why we do it. It's almost in our DNA when somebody says, oh, do you see what happened to John? And you say, oh, I saw him only last night. You think, oh, yeah, I know you saw him, but it didn't immunize him against what's happened. But we all, but we, we all do it. So that is, takes account of the people who say, oh, we saw him only last night. If you saw him only last night and he's gone within 24 hours, we would call that sudden. We'll call it sudden in colloquial terms, but we'll also call it sudden in research terms. That, those are the terms we use within one hour or within 24 hours in a patient who appears otherwise to have been well. And in the industrial world, 
that is 20% of total mortality. This is an example of somebody who happened to have a monitor on when the trouble started. So at the far end, the electrical activity is still relatively organized, and then it becomes disorganized, 602, 605, 607, and 611. So ever since I saw that slide, I've been waking up earlier and earlier. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to wake up at 602. <laughs> so these are the conventional risk factors for sudden cardiac death. These are the risk factors we get excited about in the hospital setting, but I want to broaden this outside hospital. These are the things we use. Previous sudden cardiac death, in other words, they call it failed sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death came to your door, knocked you down, but it failed because the ambulance crew arrived, or in certain very rare situations, the patient recovered. That is rare, but it can happen. And those patients get a defibrillator, unless there's some other compelling reason not to do so, or unless the patient turns us down and fights us off. We would ask the electricians to do something, at least in terms of insurance, even if we didn't do anything else. Ventricular tachycardia, you would have heard of from some of my colleagues in the past, that's when the bottom of the heart races away autonomously and takes, sometimes takes the patient away because it deteriorates. Heart attacks, anybody with a coronary artery disease, anybody with a family history, poor left ventricular function we've talked about, and heart failure. Those are the big headline things. Those are the things that everybody would understand to be a risk for sudden cardiac death. But why do some people die? It's a good question. But it's a separate question from why do some people survive? And that is what I was interested in when I was doing research. Why does somebody come in in fact, one, one of my, my reaction when I heard about my, foot, my son's football coach was, why didn't he just have a heart attack like everybody else? Because people who have a heart attack like everybody else, they come in, I have a patient who was in Newcastle, there are many examples, and I'm sure you've heard of examples yourself, of a patient who's having a heart attack, but it stands out to me because I remember him. He, had, he was having a heart attack, he thought that he better do something about it. He didn't know it was a heart attack. He got onto the kitchen floor, and started to do press-ups. Now, of course, I can tell you that because he survived to tell me that he was doing the press-ups. So he thought he was doing all these press-ups, the pain wasn't going away. And those were the days when ambulance efficiency wasn't as it is now. And this was in, in the Northeast. And so after about two or three hours, he thought he might should call somebody. Because when he called somebody, they did an ECG, found that he had a big heart attack. In those days, we did very little for heart attack patients. We managed complications. It's not like now where we'll give you aspirin, we'll give you in the days of thrombolysis, or take you straight to the catheter lab and do an angioplasty. So what I'm saying is that he survived his heart attack in spite of trying to make it worse. And then there are other people who do everything on the planet to stay away from coronary disease. They have a small artery narrowed here. They might even have seen a cardiologist. Everybody's done it. Most cardiologists who see enough patients would have seen patients who have done an angiogram on, you've looked at it, eyeballed it, you might even have done some more sophisticated tests. There isn't that much going on here. Come and see me in six months. Six months time comes, patients doesn't arrive, you ring up or you ask somebody to find, they've died. And it's presumed to be cardiac. I'm not saying it necessarily has to be cardiac, but it's presumed to be cardiac. And that happens infrequently, but still often enough for it to be tangible. If that happens across the country to each cardiologist, once every two years, that amounts to a lot of people who were not marked down as high risk. So why do some die and why do some survive without us? That's the issue. Now, I was involved in risk stratification. Risk stratification means that you're looking for ways of predicting those people who are at high risk beyond the traditional conventional measures. And the reason, as I've said, is that sudden death often strikes first and once. In other words, it may be the first inkling that anybody's had anything wrong with them. And one of the things that fascinates me, which I will only find out when it happens to me, is what then happens to people when that thing happens. You know, it, because I'm thinking, oh no, it's happened. But I can't tell anybody else what's happened yeah, because I'm going to die. You know, it may be five seconds and then you go, but we will never know what happens at that point. Maybe we will when technology improves. If we plant something so that when something happens, you'll be able to read the person's mind. 
but it's something which it fascinates me, but it also it's a bit disconcerting. But it also so it strikes first and only once. It may interrupt the natural cause of disease. As I said, the heart may be too good to die, but it's interrupted by this incident, which is an arrhythmia. Heart good, but they have ventricular tachycardia. They die. If you took that heart, there would be not much else wrong with it. So in predicting it, you emerge with a number of determinants, and those determinants give you a rationale for prevention. Even the much derided, so to speak, ejection fraction, and it's slightly tongue-in-cheek that I deride it, that came out of research. It's not, it's intuitive now, but people had to find out, do the research, to show that ejection fraction of a certain proportion was associated with sudden death. So it gives us the rationale. So the rationale we use at the moment is based on the evidence we have by looking backwards. And then we prospectively test them in studies, and if the, test, uh, the studies prove the case, the hypothesis, we apply it to clinical practice. So there are several mechanisms and models. And what I want you to take away from here is that it's not simple. Automatically, if you are at the bus stop and somebody had a problem, the easiest thing to say is that they are actually blocked. But why does the archie block and kill one person and doesn't kill the next person? There are three main areas. There are one or two other areas. But I thought I would divide the big factors involved in sudden death into three main areas. The regulation and control. So imagine a central heating on your house. It's like the thermostat that keeps everything in balance. So that's the thermostat, regulation and control, the autonomic nervous system. I'll come back to it. Atherothrombosis, which is blockage of arteries or damage of arteries, and the electrical side. So there's the wiring, there's the plumbing, and there's the thermostat. And the three, or two or three of them, have to combine to cause sudden death. But one may overwhelm the other. And that's why I've got this in the middle, a button, all three. But there are other factors which I will come to. So autonomic control of circulation became of great interest towards the end of the 80s all through the 90s and it's still of great interest. The difficulty is in getting indices that can be used in practice. I'll briefly describe this experiment. Now this experiment is a cruel experiment in 2015. You wouldn't be allowed to do it now. But what this professor did was he took some dogs and he caused, yes, I know, I'll tell you. Uh, he took some dogs and he caused a heart attack in them. So he ligated the artery going around the front of the heart, which is the left anterior descending, which is supplies quite a lot of muscle. Then in the convalescent phase, we check their autonomic function. There's a test they do, baroreceptor sensitivity. Basically, all those reflexes that slow the heart are what we call vagal. So we have yin and yang, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is the thing that makes you fight, flight, and fright, adrenaline, and so on. And on the other side, you've got the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic, broadly speaking, slows the heart down, reduces blood pressure, and it is, generally speaking, protective against arrhythmias. So he checked their parasympathetic in the convalescent period. And then he got them to run on a treadmill. He had a little like, like uh, ligature around another artery. Got the heads cruel, but he got them to run on a treadmill, and then as they were running, he cut the other artery off. And some of the dogs died, he woke them up, he defibrillated them, and the other dogs did not die. They just carried on. Their heart slowed down and they carried on. And the ones that survived were the ones who had good parasympathetic. In other words, didn't have too much of the adrenaline side. They had the other side as well. So I always go back to it because I, although in the light of modern experience, it sounds a bit cruel, and he's had demonstrations against him now because we don't use dogs in those ways, it provided a lot of evidence that the autonomic control of the circulation, or the autonomic control as such, something we don't think about, autonomic, automatic. It's responsible for saliva, for your eyes dilating. In fact, it is probably, those of you who are connected here, in other words, spouses here, it's probably the autonomic nervous system that betrayed your affection for your spouse. Because before you know it, your eyes are dilated across the room. You wouldn't know, and he knows, that something has happened. So that's the autonomic nervous system. You don't have to think about it. If I got out of the chair, if you got out of a chair, by physics, 
the blood pressure should drop from your head or the blood should drop from your head and sink into your feet. But it doesn't. Why? Because the autonomic nervous system anticipates that, increases venous return, shrinks the arteries, reduces peripheral <coughs> resistance, and drives the blood back up there. But in controlling that, it has to be equally balanced, or as balanced, not to cause arrhythmias. Arrhythmias can be caused when there's an imbalance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. This is just one of many studies that we did in humans after myocardial infarction to see whether the study carried out by Professor Billman was reproducible in some respect in patients who survived heart attacks. And we did baroreceptor testing in patients who survived heart attacks at St. George's. And we saw that those who did better had higher paras parasympathetic. And it's, that's moved on to the present day to see how we can predict cardiac death. But I won't dwell on that. I just want you to know that there is more to it than just muscle and arteries and so on. Plumbing. I talked about the thermostat. Now we come to the plumbing. A plaque is a little bit of, it's a combination of, let's call it a little volcano inside your artery. The way I look at it is like a volcano because sometimes it's quiescent, it may be dormant for months, years, and then for reasons which increasingly people are beginning to understand, it fissures, either becomes unstable, in other words, starts to jerk around, or just cracks because the top of it, the carapace, is thin or has been worn through either by chemicals or by the way it was constructed or by the tension on it and so on. And it blocks. And if it blocks, it becomes a chronic closure and then the muscle begins to wither and scar or it becomes a transient ischemia. Transient ischemia means the heart gets a bit short of blood supply from time to time, but it returns and then it becomes a bit short, then it returns again. And that can happen. And this is a traditional sort of easy to understand reason for sudden death. And then it's the interaction between those that results in the event. And now we've got modifiers. The modifiers are the sort of things that make the difference between somebody who survives and somebody who dies. In other words, you may have a modifier, an artery may block, but there may be another artery that is doing half the job. You would have heard of collaterals. They more or less hold each other's hands like a crescent in your drive, in your houses. There's work, workmen, there are workmen on this side, you can go around the other side to reach your house. So collaterals may prevent the patient having an acute ischemic burden. In other words, sufficiently large amount of uh, muscle disturbed by this reduction in blood supply to cause the event. Hemodynamic fluctuations means that the blood pressure, what happens to the blood pressure when this happens? Does it reach the point at which it becomes a vicious spiral down to uh, death, or does it recover? Drugs and electrolytes, I mention this because we, as professionals, can sometimes contribute to sudden death. The patient has heart failure. They come into hospital with big baggy legs. They're very breathless. We give them diuretics. When we give the diuretics, we get rid of salt and water, the patient, in fact, the patient feels reasonably well. In fact, they're the ones who probably run the risk more of this sort of complication than the one who's still breathless in hospital. So they get a bit better, but they've lost potassium. If you lose potassium, the way in which electricity goes across the cells that make up even your muscles, but certainly the muscles of the heart, changes. So the electricity and the excitability of the muscle changes, and it could result in ventricular fibrillation. I've done it. I can't say I haven't done it. I, didn't. I always remember Mrs. T in Newcastle. We had a transplant center, and she used to come. I, she would call me. In those days, we didn't have heart failure nurses. So if you were looking after a patient, if you really wanted to make sure that she was well controlled, you rang her. So I would ring her, and she would tell me what she was taking. I would say, well, take another this, and take another. What's your weight? She would tell me. And then the, she was waiting for a transplant at the time. And then they said, oh, Shola, your patient was found, uh, her head was wedged between the bathroom door and the kitchen because she collapsed. And what had happened was, although she was ringing me to say everything was going well, she was short of potassium. Because the, so, the, so bear it in mind 
those of you who are on diuretics, take some responsibility for checking your electrolytes because although you may be well, in fact, I've done it more than once, I'm sure I've done it more than once, you may be feeling well, but you need to make sure that insides are well protected. And the way to protect the insides is to make sure that the kidneys are doing their job, the potassium is normal, the magnesium is normal. If, if we don't remember to do them, make sure you go to your GP to have them done at intervals because they are all poisonous. What I'm trying to, trying to do is to, to uh, demystify these drugs. Yes, they are made by clever people, but they're still poisons. We just happen to be using them for a particular purpose. For example, on the news yesterday, they were talking about using a drug that was for some other condition in multiple sclerosis. In other words, they just thought, well, maybe we'll use it in multiple sclerosis. So there's nothing so, there's nothing so esoteric or so fancy about this. We're just taking drugs and seeing whether they will achieve the objective we want. In the future, we will have drugs that don't do that. In the old days, they used to use arsenic in heart failure. They used to use all these other drugs in heart disease. Now we've moved on. But one thing that hasn't really changed much is diuretics. And even some of the newer drugs that are available don't seem to have superseded diuretics. So we've got, them, we've got to live with them. But we have to recognize that they're double-edged sword. This is an example. This is following up from the plumbing. This is a fixed artery. This is supposed to be the lumen. The lumen of this artery should be all the way there. And this thing here is a plaque that has fractured. So it's fissured and you've got clot in it. First of all, you get blood, then you get clot. Once, once the inside of the artery, the blood running inside the artery is exposed to the underneath of the endothelium. The endothelium is the cover, the lining. Once that's exposed, it's war. And I won't put up all the slides where the, the war is depicted. But if you look into any textbook, when we were studying, all we knew about endothelium, endothelium, the covering of the heart, was it covers the artery walls. And then somebody won the Nobel Prize on telling us what it did. It wasn't just a blanket. It wasn't just an inert thing that just covered the wall. They did things about clotting. It stopped clotting. It made it supple. It did all sorts of things with the artery wall. So we know now that anything that damages the endothelium causes coronary disease, puts you at risk first of coronary disease, but further on from that of sudden death. So smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, all those factors deal, damage this artery wall. And when it cracks, this, this of course is on somebody who has not made it, which is why we've got this sample here. So this is what it looks like when it's fixed. Of course, in real life, it probably looks even worse than that. We deal with them in the catheter lab, but again, it is quite idealized because we're looking at it from outside on an x-ray and it's all gray and neat and tidy. I'm sure if you looked inside, we probably wouldn't want to touch it. It's probably just as well that we're looking at it on an x-ray, we put a wire through it. Because I think if you looked inside, it would look like a cave that had collapsed in on itself. This is just the, probably, I'm just using this to summarize what I've said already, which is the uncommon causes of sudden death are on that side. We're not talking about those. Cardiomyopathy will just is a general term for anybody whose muscle is damaged. And then we have the traditional risk factors. And we'll come to that when it comes to what do we do. One factor I didn't allude to yet, or I haven't alluded to yet, is luck and chance. And I deliberately put into play those three big factors there, the autonomic nervous system, system, the plumbing, and the electrical. But you can see that on a good day, you may block the artery. In fact, they tell us, people who've done the research tell us that more often than not, those arteries do explode, those volcanoes do explode without causing us any damage. In other words, you have plaques everywhere, they explode, they heal, and they don't do any harm. So what I'm saying is that there is a room for luck. Supposing somebody, in, you're in traffic, your blood pressure is beginning to rise, and you've got coronary disease, sympathetic is going up, and somebody bashes into you, you've just had an argument. In fact, it happened to one of my colleagues here. Luck. He wasn't very well. I didn't know that he hadn't been very well. It's a Friday afternoon. Somebody clamped his car. 
in the car park and he saw the person come in his car. He works here, he's been working here for 20 years or something. Somebody, and he got so angry. So I go, why are you doing it? Before we knew it, he's on the floor with that arrhythmia that I showed you initially, with everything wriggling. And they called me. It, it wouldn't have made any difference. They would have fixed him anyway. But because I was in the hospital and I was the cardiologist, they called me. And so we all rushed there and it got better. And then he had an ICD implanted. That's, he was unlucky because somebody annoyed him, but he was lucky because they annoyed him in hospital. So that he arrested in hospital and he was resuscitated and had his ICD. So he doesn't fe feature on the statistics of sudden deaths. But there are other factors beyond the external environment. And some of them are within all of us. And I brought this up just to give you an example of one of those. Now this, some of you would have heard of long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome, I haven't shown you, shown you a normal QT, but if you look at this thing here, there's a wigwam here, this peak here. There's another peak here, there's another peak here. But after this peak here, this thing is upside down. After this peak here is the right way up. And then it's upside down, then it's the right way up. That is an ECG from a two-year-old. I just got it off the internet or, or, or last week. That's the ECG of a two-year-old with a very extreme form of long QT. Long QT means that when the heart electrical impulse arrives, it has to then recover. But the, there is something wrong with the recovery period. <coughs> the recovery period should all happen more or less at the same time. But if it is prolonged, then you have some bits, it's almost like a roundabout. You've got some bits that have recovered and some bits that haven't. And in the right circumstances, either with sympathetic fright or noise or exercise, it begins to go round, the electrical impulse begins to go round and round and round the heart muscle, and then it can deteriorate through hemodynamic disturbance, blood pressure drop, and the patient can die. It's a very small proportion of the patients who die in the country, but it is potentially a reversible, or at least treatable, uh, proportion. And I put it up because it is defined by abnormalities in the channels. All of us, whether we're watching television, whether we're walking, whether you're sitting here and your muscles are working, your heart's beating, all those things depend on electrical impulses. And the electrical impulses are subserved by little channels, sodium channels, potassium channels, calcium channels, and so on. And I just put this up as an example of a sodium channel. So for something to happen, sodium has to go into the cell through a little, it just doesn't happen. There are little pores through which it goes and through which it must come out. If there is something wrong with the channels, the muscle will not work properly. It will either not work properly in ways by ways of excitation uh, or contraction, or there will be something wrong with the way electricity works within that organ, in this case, the heart. So this is uh, when it is resting, so the pores through there, it's open, then it begins to close, it's inactivated, then the whole cycle starts again. So sodium, all these things we're talking about, it's fascinating. To me, I find it fascinating because I'm thinking, I'm standing here, you're sitting there, and all these things are happening without us having to think about them. But they have practical implications. <coughs> For example, if you share, and I digress a bit, if you share a channel, say you are treating, for example, waterworks problems. And the scientists have said the best way to do this is to block the sodium channel in the waterworks. They may share structures similar to channels in your eye, for example. So they give you the thing for your waterworks. You are completely playing Mozart in the toilet because of the way you're passing, everything is working again. But you can't see properly. When you're walking around, you've got this halo. Why? Because you're sharing the same material. You see, what, so they're important. And that's why some people get side effects, which are what they call untoward effects. We, do, we see it even in, in trials. You give a drug to lower cholesterol, or you give a drug like the coccyx to treat arthritis, for example. And then you see that people, when you do the research, people are dying. Now, even the drug companies may not recognize that that was likely to happen. It may emerge post hoc. So they're important, they're fundamental to our existence. Without it, we would not be around. So if anything happens to them, this is just an example of, uh, of another pore of a channel. 
So just so that when you read about them, you can visualize what we're talking about. I think it's much more interesting to realize that these things are, they're simple in one, in one respect, they're simple, but they're also very complicated. They are responsible for allowing things in. This is a sodium channel, it will only allow sodium in. There are some for potassium, it will only allow potassium in. They will only allow potassium when the membrane is doing this. It will only allow calcium when the membrane is doing that, and it's all automatic. But if there's something wrong with them, you end up with the sort of young child that I showed you there, where arrhythmia has happened. The first description of that, I think, was when uh, I think the teacher shouted at somebody in the class, and the child died. And then when they did the study, somebody remembered, or maybe I think he slapped the child. He slapped the child, and the child died. The fright, combined with this predisposition, killed the child. But they were able to at least exonerate the teacher in so far as they were able to decide, determine that this was a predisposition, a genetic predisposition. And then somebody remembered that his sister had died when the teacher shouted at her. And that's how they found that there was something related to genetics that could be aggravated when there was an imposition of an acute stress. So these channels are important, and I mention them because there may be the difference between life and death. I mentioned the young child who had an overt abnormality, but the genetic the geneticists tell us that there are other abnormalities in our DNA that do not amount to overt disease, but may be modifying the consequences of changes on those ionic channels. In other words, let's say you have a heart attack and you are lucky. They call them protective SNPs. They call them single nucleotide. Uh, polymorphisms, doesn't matter, they call them SNPs. If you happen to have been born with an iron which is just a little bit protective, it may be the reason, quite apart from all the gross things I've talked about before, why this may modify you and the patient remains alive. And in other situations, you have small abnormalities in the ionic, ionic channels which predispose to death, on top of all the other things we talked about before, resulting in unfortunate situation like that. So having said all those things, what do we do? What I've told you that it's a matter of biology, but the biology also is influenced by chance, because when I'm asked to go and see, not asked, when I'm invited to see my colleagues, newborn babies on the maternity unit here, one of the thoughts that occurs to me, not a very romantic thought, but one of the thoughts that occurs to me is, I wonder what the genetic inheritance of this child is. Because that is going to determine a lot of what happens in their lives, at least in medical terms, and perhaps even in social economic terms. So, if there's an element of luck involved, yes, we mustn't smoke, we shouldn't have diabetes, we shouldn't get angry, and so on and so forth, but there is luck. Those little genetic mistakes and so on, may also make a difference. So having said all that, what are we going to do? Well, the traditional things we need to treat. We need better control of hypertension. We need to take lipids seriously, diabetes more seriously, and smoking, because undoubtedly they contribute to coronary disease, and coronary disease contributes to heart damage or contributes to some of the things we were talking about before, the combination of which may lead to premature death. And then, we as professionals need to take responsibility in seeing how, even in the course of investigations of other conditions, how we can, at the same time, try to reduce or look for patients who may be at risk of sudden death. So if a patient says, for example, I was running for a bus and I keeled over, I really don't know what happened to me, and you, and you say, you're sure you didn't trip? You said, no, I didn't trip, I didn't trip. Then we want to know about that because there are tests that we can do first at the bedside, but also in the laboratory to try to examine that. And if we're still in doubt, we may, under certain circumstances, put a defibrillator in. The family history of sudden or unexplained death is now an important part of the risk stratification of patients for, or subjects for death. This is from the doctor's point of view. Any patients with a family history of pacemakers, ICD, channelopathy is the sort of thing I talked about before, long QT interval. Drowning or near drowning. They tell those patients with long QT not to swim. It's particularly dangerous. There's one example in the New England Journal ages and ages ago 
when a young child died swimming and somebody had the presence of mind to investigate the rest of the family because they thought it was just an ordinary accident but it wasn't because that young girl had a long QT so they were able to uh, counsel the rest of the family against certain activities including certain professions. Any previous ECGs, in other words, if the, I saw a patient this morning whose ECG is abnormal, I don't know why it's abnormal, but we're doing some tests to see whether we can explain in retrospect and then prospectively protect that patient. Drug history, there are certain antipsychotics that are associated with, associated with an increased risk of sudden death. Diuretics I've mentioned. Habitus is somebody is carrying extra weight. Extra weight puts strain on the heart, makes the heart enlarge. Is associated with diabetes, is associated with hypertension. We have the means to treat that now, of course, with diet and so on, but with surgery. So we mustn't be shy in dealing with these factors. And not to say that necessarily everybody you treat will be protected, but in doing some of this, we should be able to reduce the risk. Murmurs, some people have not the sort of thing I've been describing before, but they've got valve disease. If they were running for a bus with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, or aortic stenosis, they may keel over. That is much more eminently treatable than some of the conditions I was talking about before. Pulse, you would have heard that a slightly higher heart rate, or heart rate is a risk factor for cardiac sudden death. In other words, the higher the heart rate, for reasons that are still need to be worked out, partly to do with autonomic function. In other words, the more sympathetic you are, the more, the higher your heart rate. And because we know that sympathetic activity is associated with features that are uh, that predict sudden death, it may be why heart rate is important. That doesn't necessarily mean that every means by which you slow the heart rate will help, but it is a marker. And of course, hypertension. And then we do, there are many of these tests, and I'll come to one or two of them before we finish. History that we've talked about, 12 read ECG. There's nothing on that ECG that you cannot use to stratify risk. You can use the rate, you can, all those little wriggles that you see in the ECG department can be used. The P wave, the little thing that goes up, notches here and there, the duration of each part of it have been used to predict risk. So we have a lot of work to do in trying to see which of those would be more, most predictive because they've all been used in some way or the other to predict these events. Halter monitoring, many of you would have had, is a machine you wear to see what happens to the heart beat, but most of you would know that it's hit or miss. If I had even a penny for the number of patients who said nothing happened while I had it on, but as soon as I took it off, the, tr the trouble started again. I wouldn't say I wouldn't be standing here, I would be standing here, but in a different suit. <laughs> <laughs> Echocardiography, you've seen, it's ultrasound. Coronary angiography, you do the, the dye x-ray test to see what's happened to the coronary arteries. There is special forms of ECG which you use to see whether there's scarring in the heart tissue. And electrophysiology studies, some of you have sort of gone out of fashion, they come and go out of fashion. That's when you want to induce an arrhythmia, a ventricular arrhythmia, arrhythmias from the bottom of the heart in the laboratory setting. So you put a little catheter into the heart and you make it go faster and faster and faster. And when you induce it, you say it's positive. And from that, you may decide to put an ICD in. So those are the things that we do. And this is a summary of some of the tests that we do for plumbing and electrical and autonomic factors. So as I said before, you look at age, history, the ECG, ordinary tests. Now, genetic testing may come. It may take time, but it may come. There are clusters of families of sudden cardiac death not necessarily because of coronary disease, but if they have coronary disease, it's not severe, but they always present, first presentation as sudden cardiac death. So the rest of the family, and they have found a certain cluster of genes, or clusters of so-called SNPs that I talked about before, that seem to identify, or seem to be associated with the risk in, that, in those families. So there are families in which that happens. And I saw a patient about a year or two ago, Italian, of, Italian descent, but, British or of Italian descent who told me that she had twin, twin sons and uh, had their husband used to drive, the, what, what are those things called, go-karts, not go-karts, but the motorsports, but not quite the F1, but the motorsport, you know, the little ones that we see around. And he died in, a, in an accident, so I was asking about the family history, he said he died. 
And then she said that one of the sons was very keen on this motor motorsport had also died in an accident. And I thought that it may well be that it's a dangerous sport and so on and so forth. But I then began to think, what, what if, with the adrenaline of the excitement of the race, the man had had an arrhythmia and crashed and died, and the son had inherited something similar and had crashed and died. So although it is quite conceivable that it were just ordinary Newtonian physical accidents, I did ask her, and I don't know whether she took me up on it, but I did write to uh, people who know about electrical stuff to see whether they would consider just looking at her ECG and the ECG of the family because it may be relevant. It may, may or not be relevant, but it may be relevant. So history is important in that respect because it doesn't cost anything. No test involved, just ask a question. And then some of the things I talked about before, our autonomic tone, we've got lots and lots of tests of autonomic tone, baroreflex, reflex. I talked about heart rate variability. We did a lot of work on uh, under Professor Kam's team. Heart rate turbulence is now becoming a little bit more uh, trendy and sexy. And then these are the easy ones to understand. Just look and see how bad the heart is damaged. And then you're looking at on a 12 lead ECG how many ectopics there are. In other words, when you put those machines on, the more ectopics there are, the more you get a bit worried. If there are ectopics that all look the same, you might say, well, it's unifocal. If they're multifocal, if they all look a little bit bizarre, like the first one, then you begin to wonder whether you should put an insurance policy in, like an ICD. Now, of course, it may well be that you put the ICD in and they never need it, but at least you feel a bit more confident that you've done that in those situations. Why? Because we don't know the answer, really, in the patients who haven't had heart disease, but who we think may be at, at risk. So the future, I'll finish up by predicting the future. Two things may happen. Either advances in technology may shoot the philosopher's fox. In other words, all the things I've talked about before may be shot away if technology improves to such an extent that all you have to do when you're born in the neonatal thing is to have something much in the same way as they inject you with vitamin K they inject you with something and it stops your heart fibrillating forever until you are 100 years old. If that happens, everything I've said tonight will probably not be relevant other than in terms of quality of life. In other words, we won't have premature sudden death. That may not happen, but advances in understanding may give us biological ICDs. What I mean by biological ICDs is that we may infer from those patients who have coronary disease but do not die the risk factors, those factors that protect them, and be able to use them in those patients who are at risk in other respects. In other words, if they say certain SNPs are associated with survival, then the geneticists and the technologists may be able to, by stem cell, for example, stem cell technology, put those SNPs into the rest of us so that we can do at least yeah, pay less premiums in our <laughs> insurance. <laughs> so a tiny ICD for all of us, wired up to Google or Skype or eBay, you laugh, it can happen. Because if they are the only people who can afford the technology to make them, then if you go for an ICD, they will insist on you being controlled from their headquarters. <laughs> and then the CCGs, of course. So thank you very much for asking me. I hope that I've made it as confusing as possible. Why? Because, because it, is, it is a difficult area. You're trying to predict the future, much in the same way as the governor of the central bank is trying to predict the economy. We're more or less in the same business, except that we're dealing with a more uh, circumscribed group. That's why he keeps missing his forecast, because it's impossible. What he's trying to do is impossible. So thank you very much.